Hi everyone, welcome to this review where we're talking about absolute value functions and quadratic functions, the parts of the function, um, how to calculate the axis of symmetry, the vertex, all that good stuff. So, ready? Let's take a look. First question, the absolute value function has a vertex of. So, the absolute value function form is f of x equals a times x minus h, close the absolute value, um, plus k. And when I look at this, the vertex is hk. So when I look at this form, f of x equals absolute value of x minus 5 and then minus 2, I can see that my a value is 1 and that my x minus h, my h value, my vertex, is this 5. Because if I plug a 5 in, x minus 5 would look like x minus 5. And then my k value is simply the number at the end, which is negative 2, and that's it. That's my vertex, 5, negative 2. Something we should notice is that, hey, if it says x minus 5, that my h value was positive 5. If it says x plus 5, that's what we're going to look at the next problem. It's the opposite sign. So now when I look at the next problem, number 2, f of x equals absolute value of x plus 6 minus 1. Well, the only way for the h value to work, if I plug it into x minus h and I get plus 6, is if the h value is negative 6. Now think about that for a moment. If I go back up here and I say x minus negative 6, would you agree that x minus negative 6 turns into x plus 6? It does. It's really the opposite sign. So then it's negative 6, negative 1. So again, if I see x plus five, x minus 5, rather, it's positive 5. If I see x plus 6, it's negative 6. But my k value is just true to whatever number is at the end. Number three, the absolute value function is the transformation from the parent graph. So if I have f of x equals absolute value of x minus 3, I would be able to say, oh, my vertex is at 3, 0. It's 3 because it's x minus 3, so 3 is my h. And then my k value is always the number at the end. You don't see anything. It means it's 0. 3, 0. So h controls the horizontal shift. When h is positive, that means it goes 3 units to the right. If h had been negative 3, that would mean it's going to the left. So because my h is a positive 3, I know it's going 3 units to the right. Now, this next one, also a transformation question. So when I look at f of x equals absolute value of x plus 2 and then minus 6, I can tell that my vertex is at negative 2, negative 6. When the h is negative, that means it moves to the left. So it would be 2 units to the left. Now, I do have two um, options here that are left 2 units. Negative 6 for the k means it's going down 6 units because k is the vertical shift. If it was positive 6, it would go up 6, but because it's negative 6, it goes down 6. So my answer is left 2, down 6. Number 5, this one, f of x equals 5 times the absolute value of x. So what we know is that the a value, right, there's a bunch of things that happen with the a value. If the absolute value of a is greater than 1, which 5 is, that's going to make the graph skinnier. It's going to make this graph more skinny. Or more narrow. It's going to be vertically stretched, like slime gets stretched, it's vertical. If a, the absolute value of a, is somewhere in between 0 and 1, like it's a fraction, like a half, two-thirds, um, it's going to make the graph not skinnier, it's actually going to make it wider, okay? It's going to be a wider v-shaped graph. So it might look like this. Um, and if a is negative, it actually means that the graph is going to be flipped upside down. And it can be upside down and also skinny or wide. Depends on what the A value is. So I see that this A value is 5, which means it's just going to be a narrower graph. It's going to be skinnier. Or now when I look at number 6, so f of x equals negative absolute value of x plus 4, I see my A value is negative. So because it's negative, that means that this graph is going to be flipped upside down or reflected vertically, vertical reflection. And my vertex is at negative 4, 0. And negative 4, 0 means it would go um, to the left 4 units, but it's not going to go up or down because the 0 is there. So it's a vertical reflection, left 4 units. Which function is wider than the parent function? Okay, so a wider graph means that the a value is a fractional value between 0 and 1. 
The only one here that has a fractional value that's between 0 and 1 is the first one f of x equals 0.5x squared plus 7x plus 4. The fact that that a value is a value between 0 and 1 means that the graph is going to be wider. If a quadratic function has a negative a value, the parabola will be, so if it's positive, the parabola is going to be facing upwards. If it's negative, the a value is going to make, to make the graph face downwards. The axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry, excuse me, so when you have a parabola, the axis of symmetry is the vertical line that cuts that parabola in half right down the middle. That's what the axis of symmetry is. It's not the lowest point. It is the vertical line of symmetry for a parabola. It's not horizontal ever. It's always vertical, and it's the highest point. No, that doesn't make any sense. If a quadratic function has a positive a value, so this is actually a graph of a positive a value. Positive a values mean that the graph is facing upwards. So that means it will always have this. This point here is the vertex, and this point is the lowest point. And the lowest point, the fancy word for lowest, is the minimum. So every graph that has a positive A value that goes up is going to have a minimum vertex. It's not necessarily true that it would have no roots. It's not going to have a maximum vertex. Graphs that are upside down would have a maximum vertex. And no line of symmetry? No, every parabola has a line of symmetry. All right, starting at question 11, we're going to look at a few questions, actually question 11, 12, and 13, that all ask to find the axis of symmetry. So the axis of symmetry is the tiniest little formula ever. It's just x equals negative b over 2a. That's it. So when I look at number 11, which says f of x equals x squared minus 6x plus 8, I see my a is 1. a is the number that's in front of your x squared. B is negative 6, C is 8. All I do is I take this formula and I plug those numbers in. So X equals negative, my B is negative 6, over 2 times A. So 2 times 1. Negative 6, negative negative 6 is just positive 6. 2 over 1 is just 2. And 6 over 2 is 3. That's it. Your axis of symmetry is X equals 3. Okay, let's look at the next one. Same skill. So this one is f of x equals negative 3x squared plus 6x plus 1. My a is negative 3, my b is 6, my c is 1. The formula is x equals negative b over 2a. So ready? If I plug those in, it would be negative 6 over 2 times negative 3. This then becomes negative 6 over negative 6, which is just 1. That's it. The axis of symmetry is at x equals 1. Last one of just this skill. Okay, f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 12x minus 9. So my axis of symmetry is x equals negative b over 2a. When I fill that in, it would become negative 12 because my 12 is my b. My a is negative 2, so it's 2 times negative 2. And then I just simplify it. This becomes negative 12 over negative 4. Negative 12 divided by negative 4 is positive 3. And that's my answer, x equals 3. Easy, easy. Okay, so now the next sets of problems ask for the coordinates of the vertex. So you have to do what we just did first and then a second layer to figure out the y value of the vertex. So first off, um, I have f of x equals x squared plus 2x minus 8. My a is 1, my b is 2. x equals negative b over 2a. So this is negative 2 over 2 times 1, which is just negative 2 over 2, which is just negative 1. But then that's the x value of the vertex. So I already know in my answer for my vertex that negative 1 is the x value. But now I need to find the y value. And so what I do is I take this negative 1 and I substitute it back in everywhere I see x in my function. So this would look like f of negative 1 equals negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 8. Negative 1 squared is just 1. 
2 times negative 1 is negative 2, minus 8. Negative 1, I'm sorry, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, minus 8 is negative 9. When you get to this final step, that's it, that's your vertex. Negative 1, negative 9. Awesome. Let's do that same process for this next one. Okay, so I have f of x equals 2x squared plus 8x plus 6. So my a is 2, my b is 8. I really only need that for my axis of symmetry formula because it's negative b over 2a. So this then becomes negative 8 over 2 times 2. Okay, that's negative 8 over 4 which is just negative two. So I know right off the bat, my vertex has an X coordinate of negative two, but I need to find my Y value. So the way I find my Y is I take this negative two and I simply plug it into all three places where you see an X. So now F of negative two equals two times negative two squared plus eight times negative two plus six. So now I'm still evaluating. So remember, exponents have to go first. Don't do 2 times negative 2 first. Do negative 2 squared first. So this is 2 times negative 2 squared, which is positive 4. 8 times negative 2 is negative 16 plus 6. 2 times 4 is 8 minus 16 plus 6. And my last line of work here. Okay, 8 minus 16 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 6 is negative 8. 2. So when I plug in a negative 2, I get negative 2 as my result, and that is my vertex. Number 16. The roots are the values of the x-intercepts of the graph. So there are three cases for roots. Ooh, not my best graphs. That's okay, though. I'm going to squeeze this last one in here. So roots are where the graph crosses the x-axis. You can have a parabola that's floating above that has no roots, none. You could have a parabola that touches the x-axis once. That's when there is one root or zero. And then you can have a parabola that actually touches the x-axis twice, which means there are two roots. Okay, so first off, number 16, the roots are the, x value, the values of the x-intercepts of the graph. That is true. Whatever that value is on the x-axis, that's where the root is. Number 17, true or false, a function can have two roots. Does one of these functions have two roots? Yeah, the last one. It can cross the x-axis twice, so that is also true. Number 18, how many roots does this function have? So look at this parabola. Is it crossing the x-axis at all? It's not, so it has zero roots. Last question, find the domain and range. So 19 is domain range. I'm actually wearing my domain and range sweatshirt today. Cute. So domain is about the x values. And when you look at a graph, a parabola, or an absolute value function, as the x values increase or decrease, this graph is going to continue to exist. It's just going to keep going. So lucky for us, the answer for domain is always the same. It's just going to simply be all real numbers. It won't change. It will just always be all real numbers. Every domain question for parabolas, absolute value, all reals. But the range is a little different. Range is about your y values. So when I look at this graph here, I notice on my y-axis, it starts at 2. And I'm just going to make a little sketch here of what this graph looks like. So I have at 1, 2, I have this parabola. So again, I'm just making a sketch of what my graph looks like here. It's not the best sketch. Actually, it looks nothing like it. So let me fix that part up because it totally extends like this. Again, not the greatest graph, but here's the point. The point is that it starts at a y value of 2. Okay, the range starts at a y value of 2. And the entire rest of that graph is above it. So the inequality we use for that is we say y is greater than or equal to 2 because it's equal to the point of 2 and then it's everything above it. So it's not all reals. It's not going to be greater. It's not going to be x. Range is y. It's simply y is greater than or equal to 2. Good luck on your quiz. I hope this video was helpful. Bye.